In this presentation, I will discuss the question of whether a syntax semantics homomorphism is cognitively plausible from the point of view of a specific version of an embodied simulated semantics. In part one, I will ask two questions concerning the idea of a syntax semantics homomorphism based on what we find in the programmatic and applied literature on argument realization. In part two, I want to give tentative answers to these questions on the basis of my own idea of an instruction grammar. The two questions I want to discuss are the following. First, given the embattiment of linguistics in cognitive psychology, is a syntax semantics homomorphism plausible from an embodied stim simulative perspective on semantics? That linguistics is in fact considered part of the cognitive sciences is a programmatic commitment of both Chomsky and linguistics and cognitive functional linguistics. Second, it will be shown that in traditional terms, verbal predicates are mostly excluded from homomorphic mappings and linking algorithms. Can this be motivated by means of an embodied simulative semantics? The phenomenon of argument realization is part of the cognitive agenda of modern linguistics. One of the best programmatic textbooks on argument realization is that by Levine and Rappaport Hovaf. In the introduction, they write, a complete theory of argument realization has to address five major questions. One, which facets of the meanings of verbs are relevant for the mapping from lexical semantics to syntax? And then further on, three, what is the nature of the algorithm which derives the syntactic expressions of arguments? And since verbs are predicates of events, a characterization of the components of verb meaning relevant to argument realization must be couched within a theory of event conceptualization. Given the cognitive agenda, I wondered whether there are some hidden assumptions in these programmatical words. And if I don't misunderstand anything, I found the following presuppositions underlying these passages. For example, in semantics there are predicates and arguments, whereas in syntax there are verbs and complements, the latter also called arguments by Levine and Rappaport Hovaf. And in the basic case, predicates map onto verbs and arguments onto complements. And since we all know that linguistics is a cognitive enterprise, predicates and arguments are the adequate means for describing semantic structures at, as cognitive structures. What is described programmatically by Levine and Rappaport Hovaf is and has been executed by different linguists. Here's an early example, Fillmore's case grammar. Without going into details, there is a lexical semantic structure for give with three ordered deep cases and they map onto deep syntactic positions following from the so-called subject selection rule. Note that the lines leading from the arguments in the case frame to the constituents in the tree do not intersect. In addition, the subject selection rule does not make reference to the predicate. Croft's framework works quite similarly. There is also a straightforward mapping between semantic arguments and syntactic argument phrases, mediated by the linking rules where subject is antecedent to object in the causal chain. Again, the verb or predicate does not play a role in the linking algorithm. For Chekendov's framework, the same is true. We see a straightforward relationship between arguments in conceptual structure and complements in syntactic structure, 
without intersections. And again, the correspondence between the verb and semantic predicates is not likewise straightforward. The last example is Baker 1997, which is also compatible with recent minimalist conceptions of argument structure. Again, the theory establishes a straightforward correspondence between arguments on the thematic, thematic hierarchy and fixed positions in the syntactic structure. The linking rules make no reference to the verb and the predicate. Baker's ideas involving his famous Utah are summed up in, these, in this quotation. If one follows the common practice of assuming that thematic roles are part of the conceptual system, then the Utah asserts, in essence, that there must be a homomorphic, perhaps even an isomorphic, relationship between this aspect of the conceptual system and the corresponding linguistic representation. The underlying idea here is similar to those of the other theories just mentioned, although it is adjusted here to the theory of principles and parameters. Nevertheless, the idea of a homomorphism seems to be widespread among theories of argument realization. Taken together, theories of argument realization try to uncover regular correspondences between predicate argument structures and syntactic structures in terms of more or less strict homomorphisms in a narrower or wider sense of the term. Homomorphism is structure preservation between representations. What we have also seen is that most linking algorithms make no reference to the predicate or verb. On the basis of these considerations, I now want to tackle the aforementioned questions, starting with the first one. Is a homomorphism plausible from an embodied simulative perspective? The embodied simulative theory in the context of which I want to discuss these questions is my own model of an instruction grammar. Its basic assumptions are quite simple. Firstly, an utterance and its underlying construction is an instruction for conceptualization. Secondly, conceptualization means simulating a perception, for example, in the visual modality where it is simulating eye movements. This in turn means that utterances and their underlying constructions are instructions to simulate a perception. Fourth, Utterances are diagrammatically iconic to simulated perceptions and vice versa. I will briefly comment on each of these points. We know from visual perception that light waves reflected from objects in the visual field build upside down images on the retina and stimulate receptive fields on the retina. The topological structure of these receptive fields is preserved in further processing stages up to the primary visual cortex V1 and even beyond. These structure preserving mappings are called retinotopic mappings. The output of the primary visual cortex can be described as the perception of a bundle of disintegrated visual features. These disintegrated visual features must be integrated into percepts of whole objects or figures in relation to a background or just ground. The so-called Gestalt laws are instrumental in grouping features into wholes. And those features are integrated into a figure which, in relation to a ground, are close to each other, are similar to each other, constitute continuous forms, constitute closed forms, and move together. The tree in this picture satisfies most of these criteria and is singled out as the figure. Now, 
if a person moves through this scene, you identify the person as the figure in relation to the background to which the tree now also belongs. Small moving things grab visual attention and are made the figure of a perception. However, we are all able to evoke visual conceptualizations even in the absence of actual stimuli, that is, in a top-down manner, and we are able to manipulate these concepts. For example, imagine a golden retriever standing on a turntable rotating clockwise. The time you require to rotate the dog can be shown to be proportional to the degree of rotation. This classical finding and the one on retin retinotopic mappings indicate that we can characterize top-down conceptualization as a simulation of bottom-up perception. And in a similar fashion, there is growing evidence that language comprehension may consist in running incremental simulations of perceptions and even actions. As a terminological guideline, just as figure and ground structure perception, trajectory and landmark structure conceptualization. That is, we always deal with figure ground or trajectory landmark configurations. This said, I can introduce the idea of diagrammatic iconicity. This is given when an arrangement of signs resembles the arrangement of its reference. Note that for a diagram, a single sign need not resemble its particular referent. Now imagine a ball is rolling into a pond. One could give the following perceptual or conceptual structure. A small moving object grabs the observer's attention and he fixates it visually and follows its trajectory relative to a ground. All this happens in time. A simple verbalization of this perception would look like this. The ball is rolling into the pond. This utterance is also extended in time and we can see that there are straightforward correspondences between constituents of the perception or conceptualization and constituents of the utterance, namely between the objects of perception, what hits the retina, and the complements in the construction, the ball and the pond. The idea is that the producer can symbolize his perception or conceptualization in a diagrammatically iconic utterance. And the comprehender can simulate this perception on the basis of the utterance which functions as an instruction for him. The instruction rationale is backed up by what we know about acquisition in situations of joint attention. In the depicted situation, the speaker says, the glass is standing on the table. The learner perceives the co corresponding relation in terms of a figure ground configuration. By means of frequent exposure to situations like these, the learner may extract regular, that is, diagrammatically iconic, correspondences between the structure of utterances and the structure of what is in his visual field. He establishes some, something like mapping rules, but note that this mapping rests solely on objects in the visual field. There is literally nothing in, percept, in, in perception corresponding to the verb in the utterance. When we look into the comprehension of active sentences, this works similarly. On the basis of the instruction Peter kisses Mary, the interpreter can incrementally simulate a corresponding perception, and the perception is trivially iconic to how the event objectively unfolds. Comparing this to the interpretation of a passive sentence, the latter is more complicated. 
When hearing Mary, the interpreter will predictively establish the concept of Mary as a trajector. When he encounters that the construction is an instance of a passive, he has to shift perspective to Peter and then follow the trajectory of Peter's activity towards Mary. This leads to a delay and decreased accuracy in the interpreter's ability to decide who is the kisser. The reason that is that in order to comprehend the passive sentence, the interpreter has to conceptualize the event in the natural order first, which, which is reversed in the linguistic instruction here. In this respect, the most economic way to encode an event is to make the instruction diagrammatically iconic to how it would be perceived, and events always proceed from cause to effect. When we look at the typological data by Dreyer, we find that the vast majority of languages indeed encode events in the order agent-like NP before patient-like NP. Hence, I would like to give a tentative answer to the first question. Is a homomorphism plausible from the perspective of an embodied simulative semantics? Now the answer is, if utterances are conceived of as instructions to simulate perceptions, speaking of a homomorphism between objects in perception or simulated perception and complements of a verb in utterances or constructions seems to be justified, but with two caveats. The homomorphism is constituted by a diagrammatic iconicity and the mapping is restricted to objects of perception. In the case of Fran put the food in the fridge, the order of thing expressions is diagrammatically iconic to first how the event unfolds and second to the order of how the event is perceived or simulated to be perceived, that is, conceptualized. Let's turn to the second question. Given that in traditional terms verbal predicates are mostly excluded from homomorphic mappings and linking algorithms, can this be motivated by means of an embodied simulative semantics? Let's briefly recapitulate. Given that an event concept is a simulation of a perception of that event and perception is based on the stimuli in the visual field hitting the retina, as I have argued, then where is the conceptual correlate of the verb? That is, what is the predicate from an embodied simulative perspective? Take again the utterance, the glass is standing on the table. We can easily segment and classify the complements and the verb in that utterance. They are both material bits, bits of the speech stream or mental representations thereof. When we look at the classical semantic side, we have a predicate argument structure. Now, what on the retina corresponds to the predicate stand? The answer is nothing. That is nothing that would be different from the objects of perception, that is the glass and the table. Rather, a predicate is, in a, is an abstraction. It is an aspect inherent to objects, but not different from objects. Thus, the relationship between predicates and arguments, or relations and objects, is as asymmetric to that between verbs and complements. That means the homomorphism does not hold between verbs and predicates or relations in the same sense as it holds for arguments or objects and complements. Is there further evidence for the primary status of objects and the secondary status of relations? 
Now Heine and Kuteva have attempted an evolutionary reconstruction of language by firstly surveying typologically stable grammaticalization paths and then running them backwards. In doing so, they arrived at different layers of development, with a category N for noun being the oldest layer, only then emerging verbs. And this converges nicely with the primacy of perceptual objects in an embodied simulative semantics and the utterance as instruction idea presented. Further evidence comes from acquisition. Gentner and Boroditsky note that nouns can be more easily acquired because objects are readily individuated in the world. The meanings of verbs and prepositions, in other words predicates or relations, are not out there in the same sense. This converges not only with the data from perception, but also with Heine's and Kuteva's evolutionary approach. So my tentative answer to the second question, why are predicates hardly ever part of linking algorithms employing the idea of a homomorphism, goes as follows. From a conceptual perspective, the relationship between verbs and their conceptual correlates is not only an analogous to that between complements and their conceptual correlates, that is objects in simulated perceptions, because strictly speaking there are no conceptual correlates of verbs except for the objects at which they manifest themselves as inherent aspects. And the embodied simulative view proposed here is compatible with the notion of homomorphism in terms of diagrammatic iconicity where objects in perception and conceptualization are related to expressions for thing-like entities in verbal instructions. Going one step further, one could boldly make the following statement. Given that argument realization is a cognitive phenomenon, an embodied simulative semantics could motivate the notion of homomorphism stemming from more formal traditions of semantics which have carried over their descriptive system of predicate argument structure, structures from logic and philosophy to a cognitively oriented linguistics. Thank you very much for your kind attention.